said to me, uh, I just got this letter from a math society and they're looking for math majors at the University of Pennsylvania, but they're doing calculations for Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And so she said to me, well, she used to work for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and they had a differential analyzer. So there were three in the United States at that time, one at MIT, one at Wright-Patterson, and there was one at Penn. And she said, oh, you must go to Penn because they've got a differential analyzer. Well, I had no idea what differential analyzer was. <laughs> but, boy, I knew one thing. Pennsylvania was not Missouri. <laughs> that was, uh, so uh, anyway, I applied for the job, and I didn't get an answer. And my father was a school teacher, and he used to come home every day with telling me about another math job. And he, he was really putting the pressure on me to get to work. And so anyway, finally, they sent me a telegram said I was hired and to get there as quick as possible. Well, I was on the midnight Wabash the next <laughs> night <laughs> out of Missouri. So I got there and, uh, uh, you know, they were calculating trajectories to make firing tables for the new guns that they were developing. And they had about 60, uh, they called us computers. I was hired for the grand total of $2,000 a year with a $400 bonus for working Saturdays. So I took this great ride to Philadelphia for $2,400 a year. Well, anyway. We don't get a bonus for working Saturdays. <laughs> well, anyway, there were about 60 people that were calculating these trajectories using Monroe and Marshawn cal calculators. Well, it was. You know, I learned how to do it, and it was fun, and Philadelphia was a lot of fun. But uh, about in May, I guess it was, uh, they announced, uh, they well, they just sent their notice around that anybody that would want to work on this new machine called the ANIAC to come, you know, anybody could apply. Well, I never had any idea what it was, but I knew it wasn't pushing a Marchant Monroe calculator. So... Uh, you know, career planning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I applied and um, went over and they just talked to us a little bit. We never saw the machine or anything. So then they called us in and uh, Herman Goldstein, who was the Army officer liaison, and uh, Dr. Cunningham, Cunningham from, from Aberdeen interviewed me. And so Herman said to me, what do you think of electricity? So I said, well, I had a physics course and I knew that E equals IR. So he said, no, I don't mean that. He said, I don't care about that. What are you, are you afraid of it? So <laughs> I said, well, no, I wasn't afraid of it. So then he explained to me the reason he'd asked me the question was that um, the ANIAC had digit trays and uh, data trays and switches and cables to plug in, so he wanted to know that I wouldn't be afraid to set switches and plug in cables. So anyway, that's my, that, and, well, no, well, wait a minute. They picked, <laughs> they picked uh, five people, which I didn't realize, all but one of them. I think I was the only one on the group that was finally picked that was ever interviewed. All the rest of them were picked for various other reasons. Anyway, uh, there were five picked, and I was the second alternate. So I thought, oh, well, that's it. So time passed, and on Friday afternoon, uh, the manager called me in and said, can you be ready to go to Aberdeen on Monday? Because they were sending the ENIAC programmers, or whatever we were at that time, we were called computers, um, to Aberdeen to learn punch card equipment because the I.O. of the ENIAC were punch cards, and our printer was an IBM tabulator. Uh, so. Uh, I said, sure, <laughs> and it turned out that the fifth girl that was selected had a very nice apartment in Philadelphia, and uh, housing was very hard, and Aberdeen was a hellhole, so <laughs> she, <laughs> she decided she didn't want to go, so she refused. Okay, so the first alternate was away on vacation. So they called her up and said she had to come home and go to Aberdeen. Well, she also knew Aberdeen was a hellhole, so she didn't come home. <laughs> so I ended up, and you know, so much for career planning. <laughs> That's how it happened. I, I think 
many of us have had our career planning go upon a similar <laughs> path. <laughs> um, Kay, how did you get involved? Well, it certainly wasn't as interesting as, <laughs> as Betty Jean's. Um, I uh, had gone to a girls' school all my life, and I went to a girls' college. And gradu I was a senior in college when the war broke out in 1941. And I graduated in 42 with a major in mathematics with no idea what in the world I was going to do with it. I just loved mathematics. I loved physics, loved everything like that. But I didn't want to teach. And there I was <laughs> with my degree, waving in my hand, but not knowing what to do with it. Within a week after I had graduated, there appeared an ad in the Philadelphia uh, Bulletin saying, wanted women college graduate math majors for school. And that was the building of the ENIAC. And it was classified. We were not told any of the information about it. But we knew that it was going to be a machine that would do these same trajectories maybe in 20 seconds in comparison with what it had been. But we were never allowed to see it or anything like that. We just knew that it was a project that was going on at the Moore School. And uh, finally, when we had VE Day, which was like June, May or June of 1945, our job there at the University of Pennsylvania was coming to an end. The war was ending. They knew the war in Japan would end very soon. And would we need any more firing tables? Well. They decided that since the ENIAC also was about to come online, it was important that they train some women, women because the men weren't yet back from the war. That was the whole thing. The men weren't back from the war. These, it was almost 100 women they had working there in, in Philadelphia, and another 100 in Aberdeen Proving Grounds just hand computing these trajectories. And here was this ENIAC about to come online. The war was over. It had been designed with the idea that uh, it was going to solve all our problems. And yet uh, the war was over, and it wasn't even running. But they sent us to Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And Betty and I and four other girls, three other girls at that time, went to Aberdeen to learn all about IBM equipment, because the IO uh, was uh, on I IBM machines. And when we came back, after 10 weeks of learning all about IBM equipment, then we were told that we had to learn what we could so that we would be able to program the ENIAC, what for? To do trajectories. Well, why do they want trajectories? Well, that was what it was built for, so that's what we were going to do. <laughs> so the, no manuals had been written, none whatsoever. So the some of the engineers who worked on the project gave us their great big blueprints, their wiring diagrams, and their block diagrams and things. And we worked our way through these things to find out what every tube would do. Now, the basic element of the ENIAC was an, something called an accumulator, which had 500 tubes in it. So essentially, uh, these were like 10 decade counters uh, uh, in each one. And once you learn what one tube did, you uh, could figure out what the other ones were supposed to do. Well, there were very many different parts of the ENIAC. As if you, any of you have seen pictures of it, you know it was 80 feet long. It was made up of 40 panels, each one two feet wide. And uh, 20 of them were uh, called accumulators, and they were to do additions and also to store numbers. Now, the complete memory of ENIAC itself was 200 digits. <laughs> it operated at 5,000 add times in one second, which then was the fastest thing in the world, incredibly faster, 5,000 times faster than any other machine operating. It seems like nothing today. The full power of that ENIAC, all 80 feet of it, could fit on a little chip, one inch square nowadays. And um, so eventually, uh, we taught ourselves how to program a trajectory for the ENIAC. And, uh, and, and then, as long as I was there, never once did we actually run a set of trajectories, although that was what it was made for. So it was your responsibility to you, you evolve yourselves into the original programmers? Yes. What our responsibility was to decide